As we begin our study of chapter 30, we realize a shift has taken place in the style and writing of structure. We leave the two-line and four-line proverbs and find instead a section of writing that resembles more closely the words found in Job or Ecclesiastes. There is a slightly darker, less positive tone to chapter 30 than the rest of Proverbs. This may largely be because of the content and topic of this unit. Most of the chapter describes arrogant, foolish thought and actions that receives God's condemnation. A part of the darkness probably comes from the purpose of this chapter and the overall structure of the book. I'll explain that later in the lesson. First, let's note that chapter 30 begins with a superscription, or title, in the first verse. Of the remaining three units, two of them do not have titles. This unit begins in chapter 30, verse 1, with the words, The sayings of Agur, son of Jaka, an oracle. This man declared to Ithiel, to Ithiel and to Ukal. This is the sixth title in Proverbs, marking a new literary unit. The previous five unit titles include chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 10, verse 1, chapter 22, verse 17, chapter 24, verse 23, and chapter 25, verse 1. And now we can add to that chapter 30, verse 1. The student of Proverbs will likely ask, who is Agur? Where did he come from? And at what time in history did he live? And why is this teaching included in Proverbs? These are all good questions and would shed much light on helping us interpret this oracle. The truth is, Agur's identity is a mystery. There are no other references to Agur in the entire Bible. Is he a real person? Or is he a fictional person invented for the purpose of creating this oracle? A couple of characteristics of Proverbs may provide a hint as to why we know so little about Agur. First, the emphasis of Proverbs is on the practical wisdom expounded and not necessarily its origin. For the book of Proverbs, wisdom is wisdom, no matter where it comes from. Second, wisdom may have more of an impact if it's disconnected from its historical roots. This may explain why we don't have more historical footnotes in the book. As we look closer at verse 1, we find several translation problems. In fact, scholars would argue chapter 30, verses 1 to 10, are the most difficult verses linguistically to interpret in all of Proverbs. Some scholars claim verse 1 may be textually corrupted, making the rest of this unit's interpretation unsure. Many of you may know that Hebrew words are often written together without spacing and without vowels. Difficult words pose a problem because translators are unsure where to separate and where and which vowel to use. For example, the Hebrew word translated oracle in the NIV Bible could also be interpreted more literally as Masa. This may be an unknown place, suggesting Agur was from Masa, and perhaps not an Israelite. Or by placing the vowels in different places, the word could be interpreted as man. If the meaning is man, it would underscore the oracle's pronouncement of human weakness and ignorance and the great divide in wisdom between God and mankind in the following verses. Additionally, Verse 1 contains two other strange words. They are Ithiel and Ukal. Most often, Bibles translate these words as names, perhaps friends or pupils of Agur, through whom we receive Agur's wisdom. However, some scholars rearrange the vowels and attempt to transform the names into phrases. For example, by rearranging the vowels, Ithiel could mean God is not with me, as it is translated in the New American Bible. And ukal could mean, I am helpless, as it's translated in today's English Version Bible. The Masoretic text, with a different word separation, could show Agur saying, I am weary, O God, I am weary, O God, and faint. This alternate translation is actually a footnote in the NIV Bible. 
The difficulty of translating the Hebrew in this chapter allows for a lively discussion among Bible scholars and hinders our ability to translate the passage with confidence. Verses 2 to 4 also cause scholars to argue among themselves. Is Agur expressing humble piety, or is he questioning God's existence and pretending to be ignorant? Let's read the passage before we comment. I am the most ignorant of men. I do not have a man's understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered up the wind in the hollows of his hands? Who has wrapped up the waters in his cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and the name of his son? Tell me if you know. A few scholars believe Agur is a skeptic challenging the existence of God. After all, no one has gone up to heaven and come back with evidence of God's existence. Others would suggest Agur is playfully forming a riddle framed in questions. Remember, understanding riddles was part of the list of purposes for the book of Proverbs in chapter 1, verse 6. The answer to this dilemma of whether Agur is a skeptic or giving a riddle may depend upon the way one interprets the answer to Agur's questions. There is a temptation for today's Christians to read the questions forming a riddle and see the answer to the first four as God. Then when Agur asks, what is the name of his son, we quickly reply, Jesus Christ. This would be an answer derived through our modern-day hermeneutic lens as Christians looking back into the Old Testament. However, since this is the Old Testament, the answer to such a riddle at that time could not be Jesus Christ who comes centuries later, though we are tempted to give that answer looking backwards into the text. A few scholars seeking to remedy this problem suggest the answer to the fifth question is Agur himself, since he is a Masaite, or a man descended from God. Or they assert Agur's name may refer to Jacob or Israel, who is the son of the Lord, according to Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. If these questions form a riddle and we cannot textually use Jesus as the answer, then Agur's fifth question becomes extremely difficult to answer. A riddle. What if we don't see this series of questions as a riddle? What if Agur's passage is intentionally placed at the end of Proverbs to answer those foolish enough to set up their wisdom in opposition to God's? What if Agur is actually warning those who would contradict God's revelation and teaching? If you remember, in chapter 9, the student of wisdom is confronted with two individuals, two choices, the house of folly and the house of wisdom. Both set themselves up in a place of honor in the city. Both set out food. Both call the simple to come and learn from them. Folly arrogantly promotes herself as an equal alternative to God's wisdom. The student must decide whose house he should enter. Perhaps Agur's questions are not intended to be cosmic in scope, but instead focus on the human condition. If this is true, then let's look at the questions through that lens. What human has gone up to heaven and come down? What human can say he has gathered up the wind in the hollow of his hands? What human can say he has wrapped up the waters in his cloak? What human can say he established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and the name of his son? Tell me if you know. In this sense, the answer to all of Agur's questions is no one. No one has done or is able to do these things. Meaning, there is no one who is so full of wisdom and power that he can arrogantly set himself up against God and challenge his revealed wisdom. According to Proverbs, anyone who does this would be a fool or in the house of folly. This may be Agur's oracle. It's a warning. Man, when compared to God, is totally ignorant and lacking in wisdom and understanding. He should humbly submit to God's wisdom rather than arrogantly oppose it. This makes verses 5 and 6 fit more neatly with the first four verses of Agur's oracle. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Do not add to His words, or He will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Human wisdom is so incomplete, it will only be flawed and fail as counsel. Only God's word and wisdom is worth seeking, learning, 
and obeying. Generally, the Bible shows that God's words are tested, and God is a shield who gives protection to those who trust in Him. Thus, any who would put their trust in human wisdom instead of God will find themselves in great trouble. Also, the warning not to add to God's word parallels Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2 and chapter 13, verse 1, and reminds many Christians of a similar warning in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. This oracle of Agur reminds me of God's rebuke of Job and his friends. They questioned God's reason for bringing ruin to Job, who was well known as a faithful servant of God. In the end, God proves himself greater in wisdom and purpose and shows Job and his friends that they have no place or authority to question his wisdom. Agor's response to this human tendency to question God and to challenge his wisdom is to pray one of the most unique prayers in the entire Bible. Let's read it. Two things I ask of you, O Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of God. At first, this prayer seems to go against biblical teaching that riches are a normal indication of God's blessing. Yet, Agur is keenly aware of the spiritual dangers for humans who can be tempted by immense riches. He expresses the most common problems for the rich and the poor. Too rich and one forgets God. Too poor and one is tempted to steal to put food on the table. Both human responses undermine religious faith, dishonor God, and set the sinner on a path to destruction. To avoid this trap, Agur asks God to keep him in the middle, neither too poor nor too rich. Agur teaches that moderation is the key to spiritually balanced and happy life. Before I move on, did you notice the reference to daily bread? This reminds me of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus asks only for His daily bread in Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. It appears to me that Jesus connects His prayer to Proverbs chapter 30 and as a result confirms the wisdom of Agur's prayer and teaching. Verse 10 is best understood as a summary statement for verses 1 to 9. Do not slander a servant to his master, or he will curse you, and you will pay for it. Initially, this verse seems to suggest, mind your own business and don't get entangled in the affairs of others. On the surface, it appears to be talking about the physical world of masters and servants. But there probably is a spiritual aspect to this verse as well. Many times in the Bible, God's patriarchs, kings, prophets, apostles, and even the Messiah are referred to as servants of God. If the context of Agur's oracle is to warn those who challenge God and His wisdom, then it would also be a warning with a curse not to slander God's servants who provide heavenly wisdom in opposition to human wisdom full of flaws. The curse such people receive in verse 10 acts as a connecting judgment for the groups described in the next section. Verses 11 to 14 provide four descriptions of those who arrogantly ignore and oppose the Lord's wisdom. Who are these groups? Let's read. There are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers, those who are pure in their own eyes and yet not cleansed of their filth, those whose eyes are ever so haughty, whose glances are so disdainful, those whose teeth are swords and whose jaws are set with knives to devour the poor from the earth, the needy from among mankind. Verses 11 to 14, I believe, develop an outline for the rest of the chapter. Some scholars suggest these four verses are numerical saying without an introduction containing the number four. I doubt this. However, it's important to note that each verse begins with the same Hebrew word that can be translated generation, class, or breed. I tend to think it refers to kind, category, or a group of people whose behavior will ingeniously and poetically be illustrated by the numerical sayings and verses to the end of chapter 30. Generally, 
The four verses condemn, number one, those who dishonor their parents, specifically a disgraceful son who is a burden. Remember, our original audience may be sons studying in a classroom setting. Number two, those who are satisfied with themselves but cannot see their own mistakes. This, by our context, can refer to blindness or unwillingness to confess personal weaknesses, ignorance, and sin. Number three, those who show their arrogance by their behavior, a human tendency to become proud when unduly exalted. And number four, those who by greed or cruelty stir up strife with others and undermine community. These verses find their themes illustrated by the numerical sayings and restated by the four admonition proverbs interjected between the numerical sayings. All of this parallelism and thematic structure hints to chapter 30 being one literary unit rather than two separate units, as most scholars argue. Part of the reason some scholars divide chapter 30 comes from the Septuagint, for it oddly inserts a title, Words of the Wise, between verses 14 and 15. This was not in the original Masoretic text from which the Septuagint is translated. The title suggests a new literary section built around the numerical sayings. However, a few scholars argue chapter 30 is a single unit that belongs to Agur. I think the four rebellious groups described in verses 11 to 14 parallel in the same order the admonition proverbs inserted between the numerical sayings illustrating a very cohesive, single, literary unit. Let's look more closely at the remainder of the chapter. In what is called by many scholars the seventh literary unit of Proverbs, though it has no superscription within the text, Chapter 30, verses 15 to 33, contains six numerical sayings and four admonition proverbs that I believe parallel, illustrate, and describe the four foolish kinds of people listed in verses 11 to 14. Numerical sayings is a broad description for a literary technique found elsewhere in the Bible. All of them begin with a stated number and must follow a formula of X, a number, and X plus 1. For example, the text will say, three things I admire, no four, or six things the Lord hates, no seven that are detestable to him. In fact, this technique occurs 38 times in the Old Testament, one of which we've already studied in the fifth speech of the Father in chapter 6, verses 16 to 19. The list of people, actions, or objects in a numerical saying tend to share a common characteristic that is the point of the saying. A numbered list is a mnemonic device for the student of wisdom to aid in memorization. Sometimes a humorous point also helps in retaining the intended principle. Let's read the first two numerical sayings found in chapter 30, verses 15 and 16. The leech has two daughters. Give, give, they cry. And there are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, land which is never satisfied with water, and fire which never says enough. Think for a moment about the leech in verse 15. It does not live by itself, but is a parasite that lives off its host. The most common leech for this context is the Hirudo medicinalis, which has two suckers, anterior and posterior, by which it attaches itself to the host to draw blood. These two suckers are referred to in this numerical saying as daughters, called give, give. A secondary application may refer to beggars with two hands out, who are seen as leeches by businessmen and wealthy citizens because they're unending financial needs. A third application could refer to a beggar's children who are often taught to beg as well. They become the daughters of the numerical saying. A more modern application could refer to emotional leeches. Some people seem to need more attention and time than others. They are like leeches in relationships, taxing, always taking but never giving, and usually avoided by others. Contextually, 
the leeches probably refer to dishonorable sons who continue to attach themselves to their parents and extract their livelihood from them. The never-satisfied condition of leeches introduces the next saying reflecting four things that are insatiable. There are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. The grave, the barren, womb, land, which is never satisfied with water, and fire, which never says enough. The grave, barren womb, land, and fire are all common human experiences that illustrate a never-satisfied status. Each in its own way cries out for more. There is never a time when the grave is full and so no one else can die. There is always room for more. Land soaks in the rain and within a few days is thirsty again. Even flooded areas will need rain within a few weeks or months. Fire will rage and never quit on its own as long as it has something to consume. And the human element of a barren womb is the most touching biblical example in this numerical saying. For Hebrew couples, and as expressed in Psalm 127 verses 3 to 5, children were thought to be a blessing from the Lord. To not have children would set up a physical and spiritual condition of constant need, want, and desire. Give, give. In case the young man studying these numerical sayings didn't make the connection to the group of people who are cursed to their fathers in verse 11, an admonition proverb is inserted here to summarize and underscore the passage. Verse 17 says, The eye that mocks a father, that scorns obedience to a mother, will be pecked out by the ravens of the valley, will be eaten by the vultures. The proverb describes a dishonorable death for a Hebrew son where the young man is left unburied, unmourned, and unvalued. He is cursed. Remember the potential historical context in which Proverbs may have been taught. Young men gather in a classroom setting where an older man uses Proverbs as a school book. He speaks to young men, using both of these numerical sayings to illustrate a disgraceful son that dishonors his parents by leeching off of them, not working for himself, always demanding and needing, sucking the resources, emotions, and livelihood from his parents instead of leaving his father and mother and being married to his own wife. Proverbs describes such a son as disgraceful and a curse to his parents, similar in thought to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 5. Another numerical saying appears to illustrate the second group listed in verse 12. It says, there are three things that are too amazing to me, four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a maiden. This list of very different things is connected by the wonder of their movement without a visual past, path, or future way. Emphasis of this saying underscores the untraceable character of their past movement. No past route is seen, and no marks are left. The immediate direction or path before them is not marked or designated. Instead, each traveler must choose his own way, speed, and the amount of effort he expends. For us who meet any of these, we would be unable to determine where they come from, how they came to meet us, and what they did along the way. The saying ends in a humorous wonder over the ways of human relationships, again, the experiences of everyday life. Some scholars suggest there is a hint that a man's way with a virgin is, in a sense, uncharted waters. However, in Proverbs, a young man with a single woman is often a warning to avoid the secret sexual pleasures that will lead the young man to his death. More specifically for this context, and tying the saying back to chapter 30, verse 12, those who are pure in their own eyes have forgotten or refused to admit what they did in the past. The admonition proverb in verse 20 provides a key to understanding the main point of this numerical saying and is connected by the word way. It says, This is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done nothing wrong. Such a statement reminds me of a similar proverb in chapter 14, verse 12. That proverb says, 
There is a way which seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. In this sense, she is like the bird, snake, ship, and specifically an encounter between the man and woman. Others cannot see what she has done in the past. Such are the ways of foolish, arrogant people who claim they are pure. For Proverbs, the adulteress eating and wiping her mouth is meant to indicate a sexual encounter. Once she has savored the affair, she cleans up and erases any sign of her way while proclaiming her innocence. The adulteress's obvious sin and claim of purity parallels the second generation of chapter 30, verse 12, who are pure in their own eyes. Either blindness to sin or hypocrisy is common to both verses. This numerical saying and proverb re-emphasizes the warning of the father to be careful of the adulteress whose ways to her house is an unseen path to death. Three numerical sayings follow the warning about the adulteress. According to the third group listed in chapter 30, verse 13, they should comment on those whose eyes are haughty or proud and whose glances are disdainful. Let's read and see what they say. Under three things the earth trembles. Under four it cannot bear up. A servant who becomes a king, a fool who is full of food, an unloved woman who is married, and a maidservant who displaces her mistress. Verses 21 to 23 contain a numerical saying describing unusual exaltations that bring intolerable social circumstances. Each example reflects one who is tempted to act inappropriately after being exalted by their good fortune. Some scholars suggest this numerical saying reflects an emphasis that the natural order of things is best left alone, disturbing that order by giving power to the incompetent or rewards to the undeserving is asking for social upheaval. Chaos comes when inferior or inexperienced people attempt to rule over those who have been placed in authority over them. However, such an explanation seems out of place for the context and structure of the chapter. The most obvious emphasis is the potential intolerable condition that comes when one is unexpectedly exalted. Pride is most pointedly underscored. This numerical saying is contrasted by a positive example of humble wisdom found among God's insignificant creatures who accomplish something great. Verses 24 to 28 say, Four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Conies are creatures of little power, yet they make their home in the crags. Locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. A lizard can be caught with a hand, yet it is found in king's palaces. This numerical saying praises small, unimportant, humble animals who by wisdom accomplish unexpected success. The diligent, always working ant is never hungry. The weak coney, probably meaning a rabbit or rock hyrax, is safe from enemies because he is able to make his home in the most impossible of rocky places. The leaderless locusts form a mighty, cohesive army that wreak havoc wherever they go, and the easily catchable lizard still lives in palaces. The emphasis is on the great things that can be accomplished by the weak, small, and humble who are determined. They are examples of humble wisdom, and they provide a positive example in opposition to the haughty eyes and disdainful glances of those who are unexpectedly exalted. The next numerical saying continues the concept of those who have haughty eyes, and this time focuses upon the way pride affects their walk. There are three things that are stately in their stride, four that move with stately bearing, a lion, mighty among beasts who retreats before nothing, a strutting rooster, a he-goat, and a king with his army behind him. Verses 29 to 31 contain the final numerical saying of chapter 30 and features animals but climaxes humorously with a king. The emphasis lies in the stately walk reflecting the pride of each. Some textual problems make interpretation difficult for this saying. The word for rooster is unsure. A few Greek translations actually use the word greyhound for a kind of dog. This translation is used in the King James Version of the Bible. To me, translating the word as a greyhound seems a poor choice because it undermines the theme and flow of the saying. 
Also, scholars don't know exactly what the king is doing before his people. Is he leading them with a walk that expresses self-importance, or is he walking confidently because his army is behind him and he has strength on his side? Either translation is intended to make the student of wisdom laugh at the human tendency that allows pride to affect the way we walk. We should realize that pride causes us to act negatively and sometimes humorously in the eyes of others. Verse 32's reference to pride summarizes the previous numerical sayings and parallels the third generation of Agur's words in chapter 30, verse 13. The verse says, If you have played the fool and exalted yourself, or if you have planned evil, clap your hand over your mouth. The action of putting a hand over the mouth may command silence to arrogant speech, but most likely means, in Middle Eastern cultures, that the proud should be ashamed by their actions and realize how they've caused others to laugh at them. Finally, verse 33 refers to stirring up strife and loosely parallels the fourth generation, chapter 30, verse 14, bringing completion to Agur's words. Let's read it. For as churning the milk produces butter, and as twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. The agitated struggle described in making butter an excellent example for the mostly rural audience of Solomon's day, and a bleeding nose, and the mention of angry strife, parallel the social and emotional turmoil brought about by those whose teeth and jaw are sword and knife in chapter 30, verse 14. Such actions only result in hurt and strained relations and do not promote peace within the community. Such actions are dishonorable and not proper behavior for young men who are students of wisdom. Notice something important here. There are no numerical sayings between verses 33 and 34. This breaks the previous format beginning in verse 15 and following. At first, I thought my outline was faulty and without merit because it was incomplete. If I were correct in that this forms a single literary unit, then why is there not a seventh numerical saying here? Seven, a a complete number. Wouldn't it be great if there was another numerical saying that fit here? Wouldn't it be wonderful if its subject matter taught on the evils of stirring up strife? Was there ever a numerical saying here? Too bad there isn't a seventh numerical saying. But wait, there is a seventh numerical saying, and it's found in chapter 6, verses 16 to 19. Well, wouldn't it be amazing if it taught on the stirring up strife? Wait. It does. Ironically, its topic of seven things the Lord hates parallels the stirring up of strife emphasized in verse 34 and fits perfectly between the last two admonition proverbs of chapter 30. It would be tempting to theorize that the numerical saying in chapter 6, which seems out of place there, was moved from chapter 30 for some reason by scribes or Solomon himself. It fits best between verses 33 and 34 of chapter 30 and seven numerical sayings all placed together would be a perfect or complete compilation, completing chapter 30. So why is one numerical saying placed somewhere else in Proverbs? Was it misplaced? Could it have been intentional? And if so, why? Could it be that the student of Proverbs was expected to realize the chapter was incomplete? Was it moved to force the student to search for it just like he was admonished to search for wisdom? Is this a riddle for the student? For whatever reason, the missing numerical saying in chapter 30 can be found in chapter 6. This creates a mystery we may be expected to meditate upon for a long time as a student of Proverbs. If my study is correct, then chapter 30 contains only one literary unit instead of the traditional two. This explains why one of the units doesn't have a title in the original text. If true, then chapter 30 parallels speech number two as being some of the most elegantly crafted passages in the entire Bible. In essence, chapter 30 warns those who arrogantly question God's wisdom and set themselves up as equal in wisdom. Agor's questions remind us of the huge gap between man and God in wisdom, actions, and power. 
The descriptions of four groups of rebellious humans remains as accurate today as it was 3,000 years ago. Some today dismiss this wisdom by simply saying it's archaic, old. But wouldn't that be an obvious sign of someone sitting in the house of folly? I think so. Perhaps here is a good place to stop and examine where you stand concerning wisdom. Do you find yourself among one of the four groups of arrogant, rebellious generations? Which house are you sitting in? Think about it. Until next time.